On the edge of the Atlantic lies a world of rock and water. Wind scoured and rugged, yet full of grace and beauty. Exposed to a restless ocean and Europe's wildest weather, the animals of these islands face challenge after challenge. For a year, we'll follow life in this magical but unpredictable place. Revealing secret lives and mysterious worlds. Rarely seen and never filmed here before. Here, on Scotland's wild west coast. Here, in the Hebrides. In Britain, the Outer Hebrides are as far west as you can go. Of all the islands on the edge, these are the most exposed to the raw power of the Atlantic. They form a long chain and carry an ancient sense of place in their names. Bernary, Bambecula, Uist, Lewis, and Harris, with mountains made from the same rock as the moon. There's an otherworldliness here that sets these islands apart from anywhere else in Europe. Along this final frontier are even more remote satellites, outlying rocks and stacks. And these reveal why the Outer Hebrides are so special. On these islands are some of the largest seabird colonies in Europe. Northern gannets alone number more than 100,000 birds. The greatest gathering on the planet. It's mid-June, and all the Hebridean seabirds have just a few short months to raise a family. Summer is brief here, even by Scottish standards. And this year, the weather has been particularly cool.
in spring, the Hebrides were hit by a devastating storm. The worst for many years. Its effect was catastrophic. Many birds lost eggs and nests. They had to put their breeding season on hold, just as it was starting. An already brief summer is now even shorter. On the outlying islands, there's a real sense of urgency in the huge puffin colonies. The torrential rain flooded many burrows, and it's been hard work digging them out again. Deep in the back of this burrow nestles a single three-week-old chick a puffling. Her parents have been together for many years. They constantly reaffirm their bond with ritualized head flicking. Every day they fly out to sea to bring her food each clocking up to a hundred kilometers. Because of the setbacks this year, the parents are under even greater pressure than usual. They must feed the puffling quickly and often, so she'll be ready to leave by autumn. And there's another problem. Great skewers, locally known as bonksies, make a living mugging other seabirds. They can bully gannets twice their size into coughing up their catch. third of the skewer's weight, puffins are a pushover. The bonksies prowl the colony, seizing any opportunity that comes their way. They're quite capable of dragging a puffling from its hole and devouring it. So the chick must stay well clear of the entrance. For thousands of years, the seas around these islands have sustained not just seabirds, but people. On the east coast of the Isle of Lewis, sheltered from Atlantic gales, lies the town of Stornoway. It's easily the best harbour in the Outer Hebrides. In the days when traveling across Europe was slow and dangerous, Stornoway was an important crossroads for people using the sea. Bronze Age traders, Celts and Vikings all came here and made this a cosmopolitan place. Even the town's name comes from the ancient tongue of the Vikings. Stornoway has always been an important fishing port, and it's still home to many boats.
A group of grey seals hangs out in the harbour, waiting for the returning fleet. This mature bull has realised that the boats can supply him with a free fish supper. Living here certainly means you don't need to work too hard to earn regular meals. Back in the puffin colony, getting a meal is a matter of life and death. The Bonksies are hunting hard. They're hungry too. The three-week-old puffling is keeping safe at the back of the burrow. But another youngster has made a fatal mistake. It's a lucky escape for the puffling. But now the Bonksies turn their attention to its parents. To deliver this precious catch, they have to run the gauntlet. Every time they feed their puffling, it's a triumph. The chicks which survive can live for more than 30 years. Little birds with a lot of experience. The seas around the Outer Hebrides are rich. And despite the storms earlier in the year, it's turning out to be an exceptionally good year for fish. There's plenty of food here to support large shoals. But you still have to know where to find them. In the sound of Barra, a pod of 15 bottlenose dolphins know all the tricks of the trade. They can read these complex tidal waters as only true residents can.
Sometimes they save energy by bow riding fishing boats which are going the same way. After all, fishermen need to read the currents and tides too. This pod will work these waters all summer, making the most of this short time of plenty. Now the local residents are joined by long-distance travelers. Missing the spring storms by just a few weeks, a flock of migrants arrives on the warm south wind. Arctic terns. They've flown almost 19,000 kilometers from the Antarctic to the island of Lewis. Here, just north of Stornoway town, they're checking out a small river island, rich with blooming sea pinks. It seems ideal. There are no ground predators here, and on the doorstep is a great source of food. Broad Bay is sheltered, and the many animals already feeding here are proof of how rich it is. Otters fish the rising tide while eider ducks die for mussels. The terns decide to settle here. They explore the river island working out where they want to nest. Terns, like so many seabirds, mate for life. And these kind of decisions take time. so far, they might as well get it right. Now that's done, the male needs to cement their relationship. All he has to do is to head out into the bay and find a small gift for his mate. Shrimps are too slippery. A plump sand eel from further out might be better. Once he's got a good grip. Now it's just a case of getting it back home. But once again, there are pirates waiting in the wings. This time, they're arctic skewers, swift, maneuverable, and persistent. A bonksy moves in on the colony. This needs teamwork.
But it's all worth it to hand over the prize. It's early July. With 18 hours of daylight, conditions are perfect for growing crops. But even now, farming in the Outer Hebrides is never easy. The islands of Uist and Bembecula appear the most unforgiving. Scraped by long gone glaciers, they're now as much water as land. This show was created for you and your family to watch together. Welcome to Nat Geo Wild. But running down the Atlantic side of the islands is one of the jewels of the Hebrides. The Macher. between the unfertile moorland and the sea. It's like a Scottish Garden of Eden. Over centuries, the winds have blown shell sand up onto the islands, balancing out the acid of the peat. Macare wouldn't be this rich if it wasn't for people. Generations of crofters have carried seaweed onto the land to make it more fertile, and they leave the small fields fallow in some years, allowing wild flowers, insects, and birds to move in. In high summer, the Macare hums with rare bees like the moss carder and the great yellow bumblebee, extinct in most of mainland Britain. Meadows like this hardly exist there anymore because of intensive farming. There are always corners for the corn crake, whose surreal rasping call is heard almost nowhere else in Britain. It's flourishing here in the U.S. The rich supply of insects makes this an ideal home for skylarks. Their nest is well hidden amongst the flowers. The chicks are brilliantly camouflaged with tendril-like feathers on their heads helping them blend in with the grass. The air is also globally important because it's home for birds like lapwings which nest on the ground. In a normal year, they'd have finished raising their chicks by now but they were also hit by the storms. So along with other local residents like red shanks and oyster catchers, they're sharing the mac air with recently arrived migrants. It's much more crowded than usual, and the lapwings are kept busy defending their patch.
Wader chicks hatch fully fluffed up and ready to go. It's like keeping control of half a dozen wayward toddlers all at once. The mother lapwing has a real job on her hands to keep her brood together and safe. The unseasonal spring storms have been followed by one of the driest summers in living memory. It hasn't rained for weeks. Throughout July, the ground nesting birds work frantically. The skylark chicks that seemed so small and defenseless just weeks ago are now chasing their parents for food. The plants are wilting, but there's still plenty of insects for the many young wading birds. They're growing fast, but still can't fly. The lapwing chicks have grown, but the brood is down to just two. It's a bigger loss of life than you'd expect in a place without ground predators. It's suspicious. The alarm goes up. A ferret, an escaped domestic animal, is on the loose and causing chaos. The waders mob it, trying to drive it away from their flightless chicks. But it's too late. It's got one. It vanishes into the long grass, but the damage is done. Introduced animals like ferrets can cause havoc in this fragile place. But that's not the only problem. The Uist Mac Air is less than two meters above sea level in many places. Now the climate is changing, and with it the sea is slowly rising. These low-lying islands are in danger of being claimed by the ocean. Here, where change is a fact of life, they say, what the wind brings, the current takes away. It's a reminder that whatever we might like to believe, Living here on the outermost edge of the Hebrides is on the ocean's terms. It's August, and the Outer Hebrides appear almost tropical as the sun beats down day after day. The drought is causing a real problem for Atlantic salmon. 
After a life at sea, they're gathering by the mouth of their home river, close to Amansui Castle on Harris. To complete their life cycle, they need to swim upstream to spawn. They've traveled here from Greenland to do this. But the last stage of their long journey is impossible, as the river is too low. It's not a problem for dippers. They work the riverbed for insects which thrive in the bubbling water. Unable to advance, the waiting salmon are being picked off by grey seals. It'll take a great deal of rain to raise the river enough for the fish to advance. In the hills above the castle, a family of red-throated divers are also at a turning point in their lives. The two chicks are growing fast, and they're hungry. But one is larger and more aggressive. It's quite rare for a second chick to even get this far. Usually it would lose out on most of the feeds and die. But fish have been so plentiful this year that both chicks are almost ready to head out to sea. They just need to learn how to fly. The parents take off and land to show their youngsters exactly how it's done. But it's a challenging skill to master. This chick still has some way to go. You also need a lot of extra lift when your home is surrounded by mountains this steep. They don't have long. There's a change in the air. Autumn will be closing in soon. Storm clouds are building. In a narrow sea lock in South Uist, 60 pilot whales have become trapped. They're creatures of the open ocean, but they may have followed a shoal of squid into this dangerous place. It's not good. They're not used to being hemmed in like this, and the younger whales are starting to panic. Several have cut themselves on the sharp rocks. Their distress grows. 
The shore is dangerously close. The stranding is now a real possibility. But luck is on their side. The tide is rising, opening the door of their prison. And the pod starts to move back towards safety in the open ocean. It's almost a relief after four weeks of drought, when normal Hebridean weather returns. of Harris, the rivers are swelling and the water thunders towards the sea. Finally on their way. The summer rain has replenished the Macair lands too. Crops are ripening as the wild flowers set seed. In the Uists, crofters will soon be bringing the harvest in. But there's always seed to spare for small mammals, which is good news for birds of prey. A recently fledged short-eared owl watches one of its parents quarter the fields, hunting for mice and voles. The mac air is quieter now. The wading birds have moved off the fields and onto the beach. Seaweed, washed up by the spring storm, is rotting quickly in the midsummer heat. Hordes of insects have been attracted to feed on the decaying piles. Springtails eat bacteria that break down the kelp. As the tide sweeps in, they swarm into clusters. On the surface, they're fair game for passing turns.
In time, these piles of kelp will be laid on the Macair, and the richness of the ocean will revitalize the crofters' fields. It's September, and across the Uists, ancient machinery grinds into life. It's harvest time. Once the crops are cut, they're gathered into sheaves and then piled into stooks and stacks. It's a system practiced here for centuries. It works for people. And it works for wildlife too. But the knowledge of how delicately it all fits together is fading along with this generation of crofters. The high school on Bembecula is addressing this dilemma by offering a special crofting course. Students get hands-on experience of the fine art of stooking and stacking. Up. See, we have to just keep it tight in together. So the water's gonna shed off one onto the next, onto the next. Hold on. What do you call it in Gaelic? You've probably heard it, or you're... Kruach! Oh, yeah. I'll say that, though. Yeah. Oh, start from here. It's not just popular. It's oversubscribed. It's up to this generation of school leavers to decide whether the Macair lives on. Yeah, and these are exactly the people who will be the most tempted to leave the Outer Isles for a mainland, mainstream life. As summer turns to autumn, the gannets, divers and terns will leave these islands and spread out across the globe. darkness, the pufflings will slip out to sea to spend many long months on the open ocean. But they'll be back, because there's nowhere better than the Hebrides. These precious islands on the edge are some of the best places for wildlife anywhere in the world.